begin? And uh, what I wanted to call out is um, he has another, we all have special skills. And you're a ventrilo ventriloquist? Well, professional puppeteer. Professional puppeteer. Oh, hence the bear. The bear. Yeah. Hence the okay. bear, oh. yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> Um, you know, a Asheville and, and the Bayer community wel welcomes you. Uh, <laughs> you're advocating for, for the Bayer. So with that, <laughs> uh, I'm going to close the door and I uh, simply can begin. Yes, the, uh, the Black Bear is my own creation, by the way, and uh, I build as well as perform. And it's almost kind of appropriate that the other reason I have come to Asheville is for puppetry festivals. So both sides of my work brought me here. So this is building a lamp-based web server in the 21st century, and if you want to follow along, you can try going to webdev-prez.iac.gatech.edu. I say try because, as is, again, a pro, pro our DNS system at campus uh, decided to go take a nosedive yesterday, and they're still trying to recover it, so you may or may not be able to connect. Um, as with all good presenters, I have my slides also on my notebook, so I don't have to worry about the internet. <laughs> so, um, brief outline of what I'm going to present today. I'm going to start out with the little bit of background on why we uh, needed to look at new options for web hosting and what options I reviewed and why I went with the LAMP server option. Then we'll move into the architecture of the solution I put together. And then I'm going to give you a step-by-step -step guide to how to build one of these servers um, using PHP FPM or Fast Process Management. And then finally, I'm going to give a quick overview on how to secure the server. It's not going to be all-encompassing, but it will hit the highlights of some of the big things you'll want to do. So, I have been with Georgia Tech for almost 31 years. Um, I started out as a student many years ago, and I went to work for Central IT. I worked with computer labs, moved into web application support, supported the central learning management system, and built and supported a digital media repository. And finally got tired of being on call on weekends and evenings and vacations and said, I've been working with Drupal on the side and other small projects. I want to move into that and be a developer. Developers don't have to be on call all the time. So I switched gears and I moved to the College of Liberal Arts, staying at Georgia Tech. And I've been with them now for nearly 10 years. When I got there, um, they had their own web hosting. We have central campus hosting, but they were running their own. Um, they wanted more access, more control than they could get through the central hosting, which is somewhat locked down. And they had actually, ironically, been on LAMP servers, but they had decided to move to CPAL. So just to make sure everybody's on the level playing field and knows what's what, CPAL is a commercial web hosting system. Mm -hmm. And the, the main feature of it is that it lets everyday people control a web hosting account through a web-based uh, GUI control panel rather than having to configure everything from a command line. Um, it's used by many commercial hosting companies, big and small, ISPs and regular hosting providers. Um, one of the major alternatives to it is a product called Plesk. The interesting thing I discovered is that uh, they're actually both owned by the same parent company. So, so much for competition, but <laughs> it is what it is. Both of them are commercial, so we had yearly license fees and we had some excessive maintenance work at times. But our feeling was it wasn't broke, so let's not try to fix it. You know, I was the new guy there, so in the beginning I didn't want to push for making another big change when they had just put this in place. Um, 
So I did my best to learn how to support it. Um, I had done some support for Plesk because of working in central IT, but I had never worked with cPanel before this. And so for about eight years, we stayed that course, and it, it filled a need. It did provide functions that the old LAMP servers didn't provide. But come last year, we decided it was time to reevaluate what we were running. So what was the catalyst for this? There were several of them. cPanel is very complicated, and it's very, very um, proprietary. Even though it's got some open source parts under the hood, they've done a lot of custom coding. It got to be very frustrating to manage it day to day. Their administrative control menu has about 40 to 50 options on it. It's so big they provide its own search function to help you search out the menu item you need because you can't scan through them all on your own. And we only needed a fraction of that. Being a you know, big educational institution, our college within the institution, we can't run our own DNS, we can't run our own email, we have to use the campus versions. So we didn't need those components of cPanel. Uh, we aren't selling anything, we didn't need the marketplace functions, but we couldn't remove any of that. We just had to work around them being there. Um, the SSL was a big pain. Ten years ago, you only had to change certificates out every three years. So even if it's a pain, you can grin and bear it if you only have to do it every three years. But then it went down to two years. Now it's down to one year. And it just gets very difficult with cPanel because, again, it's so proprietary, there's no way to go on the back end and just swap out certificate files. Even though we have a wildcard cert that covers all of our sites, all of our domains, we still had to go in through the GUI, touch every single site. We had about 50 sites on there, so you can kind of imagine how long that took every time we had to replace the certificates. Um, there were some unnecessary patching error messages that came out in the cron email every night. And we searched and we searched and we couldn't find a way to resolve that. It's like it wasn't really a problem, but it wasn't something we could mute either, so we had to you know, ignore those messages coming through every day. The biggest catalyst of all, though, was that we were running on Red Hat, uh, Red Hat 7, or RHEL 7, right. and RHEL 7 reached its end of life last month, so we knew we had to do something, and we came to find that CPAL was no longer working with Red Hat. They had never released a version to work with Red Hat 8. Um, so it looks like they changed gears and wanted to partner more with Cloud Linux, which is another commercial Linux system. Mm -hmm. And we really didn't want to switch that direction. If anything, we found they had started supporting Ubuntu, and we had become a big Ubuntu house. So we were looking at that, but even there, they have never yet released support for Ubuntu 22, only Ubuntu 20, which is, relates to the year 2020. So, while 2020 is still supported long term until next year, we like to upgrade fairly soon after a new version comes out. So, it'd be kind of awkward having to wait. And in fact, we don't really see where we can say there's a guarantee we're going to ever support another Ubuntu. So, we could get into that and get stuck and have to change over again. Um, so, it's like, okay, let's look for something other than cPanel. Well, the options that I found, besides going with cPanel on one of the few Linuxes that they support, we could switch to Plesk. And that was kind of my, if nothing else works, we'll go to Plesk. Because if we knew Central IT's running it, we could look to them for answering questions and helping us out. Um, it runs on a bunch of different Linuxes. It's much more generic the way they built it. Um, and it's had a long time of uh, Ubuntu support, so we knew we could go that way. You might ask, well, what about putting it on the OIT servers? Well, they're still kind of locked down. So we can't run things on there like Drush and Composer because of the jail uh, shell. So we still really didn't want to go there. We have a few sites on their servers because they promise 24-7 uptime. They'll have people on call after hours if anything goes wrong. We don't want to have to fool with that. So we put our school sites and our college site over there, and then we don't have to worry about the uptime. 
But all of their other sites are smaller ones that don't need 24-7 uptime. We like to keep them on our own servers. We could go with an open source web control panel system. There are some out there. There's probably a dozen out there. Uh, I'm not listing them here because I didn't find any one that seemed to like stick out beyond the others. It's kind of like when you, it's kind of like in the content management system world, there's all these different ones. Then there's Drupal and WordPress that kind of stick out beyond all the others, but nothing really did with control panels. And none of them seem to get a really stellar rating and review, so I just didn't think any of them were what we really wanted. So that took me back to LAMP, just building it yourself. Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Everything open source. But one issue was I wanted to maintain privilege separation. And what that means is that every site runs under a separate Linux user account. So if somebody hacks one site, they're not going to easily be able to go look at the files of all the other sites and possibly hack every site on the server. They'll be kind of locked into that one site that they hacked. But how do you do that? I knew of some modules in the past, but everyone I looked up and looked at was no longer supported, defunct. So you obviously don't want to run things that are defunct. Um, and I, I even looked at cPanel and tried to figure out what they were doing under the hood. And I thought maybe you know, there was a specific module for Apache they were running. If I could identify it, I could figure out if we could you know, obtain it, whether it's open source or purchasable. I could never figure out what they were doing. I think it's something hard baked into Easy Apache, which is a commercial Apache solution that is part of cPanel. And so that didn't really help us very much. So I, you know, I had kind of gotten stuck there, and I kept pushing off what to do until we hit that Red Hat issue. And right about that time, I was sitting in a Drupal users group meeting. These things are so useful for so many different ways. Uh, one of our central IT folks who does web hosting support was presenting about PHP fast process management. And I was listening to what he was talking about and just light bulb went off over my head. This might be the way to do it now. I just have to look at it from a different point of view. Um, and so what is this? PHP fast process management. Well. Normally, traditionally, you would run what's called Live Apache PHP module, which is a module that you plug into Apache HTTPD. And that takes care of processing any PHP scripts. It just goes out and calls the PHP um, executable to interpret the script, grabs the output, sends it back to the browser. Um, that works great, but it has some limitations. One of them is that all sites share a single process pool. And if one site gets hit a lot, it can eat up all the processes and none of the other sites can be accessed until you know, that wave of hits on the big site starts to, you know, uh, to wane. So PHP FPM solved that by running it as its own daemon. And then it can be configured with multiple pools. And so you could then set one pool per site, or you could do one pool for a big site and one pool for a bunch of smaller sites. It's fully configurable any way you want. And each pool has dedicated threads. So if one pool runs out of threads, it's not going to stop the other pools from running. They'll continue to you know, handle requests. But the thing that really stuck out to me about this is that not only can you get that better thread control, but each pool can be configured to run under its own user ID and group ID. So it's like, aha, I can connect this together. I can create a user account for a site, create a pool that will handle all the PHP for that site, and map it to that user account. And then that site is privilege separated. Um, there are some pros and cons to FPM. Um, while you do have the dedicated threads, which help keep a big site from hurting a small site, you do have to kind of monitor it, especially with big sites. You may have to tweak and configure so that the big site doesn't run out of threads too soon. <coughs> so it's not just necessarily a drop it, run it, drop it in, run and go. You may have to, you know, monitor it a little more. 
in a traditional setup. So what we ended up with, I set up two production Ubuntu 22 LAMP servers. Uh, there's one for our Drupal and our custom PHP. There's a second one for our WordPress, Omeka, and Static HTML sites. There's nothing magical about the separation. That's just by the number of sites that kind of balance it out. I mainly I wanted to keep like all Drupal in one place, have one server with them so that I could potentially start setting up automation, a script that would go through and patch all the sites at once. And if they're in one place, that's a lot easier than having to duplicate that to other servers. Yes? These are two physical Ubuntu servers or they're... Virtual machines. Okay. Virtual machines. Okay. Yeah. All of our servers are VMs running under VMware. Gotcha. Right. Um, so one thing I wanted to implement here, different from what we've done in the past, is that these are truly production machines. So our end users cannot SCP or SFTP into them or SSH into them. They can access like admin control panels within WordPress or within Drupal, but they can't access the command line or the files on the back end. So there's no development going on here. There's nobody messing with the files. Uh, only people who access the file system are IT staff like me. Then there's a development server, and it's the same configuration, but we hardware firewall it to campus and VPN. And so it's not open to the world. It's the same setup, the same configuration, so if we build there and copy it over, it should cross fingers work because nothing's different as far as libraries and PHP versions and so forth. Uh, and so because of that, we will give a user who wants to develop command line access if they want it. Um, that will be done using SSH keys. So that uh, we aren't dealing with passwords. Passwords are just old fashioned, hard to you know, keep secure. So we'll give them a user account under their own Georgia Tech user account name and then set up an SSH key so they can SSH into the web hosting account. That also means the web hosting account, any changes being made there are done under that username, not under various individual users who are maintaining it. We don't get this weird mix of ownerships that can mess things up. If a user wants to build there and make a site public, we'll go through a, a process to pull their changes up to production, much like the, you know, the uh, systems where it's like, building development, push up to task, and then push up to production. We're trying to implement that in a simpler fashion than you know, some of the other systems out there, but still to have that separation so that production stays more stable and secure. Uh, so each website lives in its own user account. The virtual host group is in the user account's home directory, so it's modeled a lot after both cPanel and Plesk. The privilege separation handled by PHP Fast Process Management. This does mean that all the non-PHP files, they're still being served by Apache, by the common www-data user. But so far I haven't seen any issues with that. Um, things run the way they're supposed to. I've been running all those things I mentioned, WordPress, Drupal, et cetera, and they all run properly. I haven't seen any way that this could present a security issue, but of course, anything with security, you can never be 100% secure, right? There's always something that could come up that nobody guessed at beforehand. <laughs> but it seems pretty stable to me. Uh, this just shows you what a user account looks like if you want to try to visualize it a little more. So under slash home slash whatever the user account would be, uh, you have an HTTPS docs that is the site root. You have a symlink named logs that points to the actual logs under slash var slash log slash Apache 2. I do it that way so all the log files physically stay in the same subdirectory and then I could run scans across them much more easily than if they were spread out across all these different user account home directories. Rotate them better that way too. What? You can rotate them better that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, we use SSH keys, so we stick in a .ssh directory with the keys in the authorized keys file. 
It's fairly straightforward. So next up is how you do this yourself. I'm going to show a lot of data here, but I'm going to I'm not going to go through every single line because we just don't have time for that. But you can pull these slides yourself. And there's also configuration files where I have the presentation hosted, so you can grab the sample configuration files, and that gives you a big jump start. I do want to say to start with disclaimer, disclaimer, use at your own risk, caveat emptor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've tried to make sure this works right. I've tried to make sure I'm doing things in a reasonably secure way, but I am not the end-all, be-all expert of security and, and you know, Linux web hosting. Uh, very, very few people have that level of, of knowledge. So research for yourself. That's my best advice. Make sure you understand what you're doing before you do it. Make sure I like this rule of thumb. Make sure you can justify what you're doing to your supervisor's supervisor. <laughs> you know, feel sure that you can explain it in a way they would understand and in a way that you think they would accept and approve. If you can't do that, do more research. Get a better feel for what you're doing. Uh, don't just copy stuff blindly from my site and break your stuff and blame me. Don't do that. <laughs> So first thing you have to do is install Linux. Pick a Linux, any Linux. Um, you can use any version of Linux you feel comfortable with that your organization will approve of. Uh, the major ones are Ubuntu and Red Hat, at least from my research. Uh, Ubuntu is the major free and open source Linux. Um, they do long-term support version. It's good for two years, excuse me, they release every two years and they're good for five years. So that's a pretty good time frame there. Um, I find it's easy to use, it's robust. It has a script gig upgrade path, so you don't have to build a new server every time. You just run an upgrade script and it'll do all the upgrading for you. It's gotten down now where I can do an upgrade in about 20 minutes. Uh, it used to be it took more like about an hour just because of the way it went about it. Ubuntu's come out with a, re a recent 24.04 desktop mm. Chrome version. Yes, with yeah. Live patching, live kernel patching, mm. and upgrades or patching and everything and, and uh, uh, security updates and all for 2038 mm. beyond the LTS. So it's really, really nice. And uh, the other Another alternative is Red Hat that is a commercial Linux, Red Hat Enterprise License or RHEL. So it's commercial, but Georgia Tech has a, a campus license for it, so we have a lot of people using it there. We used it some, but we eventually kind of preferred moving over to Ubuntu. It's just kind of easier to manage. Their long-term versions tend to last up to 10 years, but you have to more or less build a whole new server when you go to another version. and. Uh, because of that, you have a longer span where components don't get updated unless you go figure a way around, you know, what they provide in their repositories. You can use any other variant. Your mileage might vary. This presentation is going to show you how to do it in Ubuntu 22. So for other versions, there may be different commands, different repository names, etc. You'll have to research into that if you want to take a different direction. Whatever you use, select the server version. You don't need the desktop components on something like this. So why load them? Why have them take up disk space and memory and so forth? And some of them may even give you a web server option. You could look at going ahead and doing that, and that may pre-install some of the things I'm showing you, and you don't have to go through it step by step. So you'll need the Apache HTTP packages. The only one you absolutely need is Apache 2. I listed some others that we will use. The Offcast is primarily for education. Education uses central authentication service a lot. I don't know that too many people outside of education use it. And Invasive and Security 2. Security 2 is a web application firewall. And Invasive is a tool to block denial of service attacks. Very useful. Um, you don't need to install the Live Apache 2 dash mod dash PHP because all of your PHP will be handled through FPM. So you can leave that one off and have one less thing, you know, on your server. For MySQL, you'll need the MySQL server. 
I think that might install client automatically, but if it doesn't, you'll need the client components as well to be able to manage everything. Make sure you set a secure root password. Don't leave it blank. Don't set it to root or password or something silly like that because you know, there's more and more attacks in the current day and age against uh, my database servers. And use the hardening script if it's not run automatically. I think it gets run now when you install automatically. I remember the days when you had to run it by hand and otherwise you had everything kind of left wide open. <laughs> These are the modules we run. Um, again, I'm not going to go through it step by step because of time, but um, some of the key ones um, that I haven't mentioned already, you'll want proxy and proxy FCGI because PHP FPM runs as a fast CGI proxy. Uh, of course, you need rewrite for Drupal. Um, and SSL, strongly recommended for your sites. Um, I still haven't seen where browsers are requiring it yet. I heard about that years ago. They're going to start requiring it, and I don't think they've ever enforced that. But it's probably going to come one of these days, so it's good to just go ahead and set all your sites up with SSL and be done with it. Um, Ubuntu 22 only comes with PHP 8.1. I don't know what version 24 is coming with, but um, I would assume maybe 8.3, but I don't know for sure. But um, if you're going ahead and right now with 22, you may want a newer version. Ubuntu only puts one version in the repository for each version of Ubuntu. So you can't just do, you know, apt install and a new version and away you go. You've got to do a little more configuration. What you can do is add an external repository that has other PHP versions. And these are the commands that will install a repository named Andre slash PHP. I looked this up. I've seen several references to it. It looks like a trustworthy, usable, uh, proper repository. But do your own research. Make sure you're comfortable with it before you just go adding it blindly to your sites or servers. But they provide multiple versions of PHP for every version of Ubuntu that's come out in the last, you know, few decade, last decade or so. So it's good not only if you want to run a newer version, but if you should have an app that you cannot get upgraded and it needs an old version of PHP, this is a way to add the old version uh, without having to just sit there and compile it from scratch. So you um, apt update, apt install software dash properties dash common, and the important one, apt um, add dash app dash repository. And the repository is ppa colon andre o n d r e j slash php. Once you do that, you can use your apt dash git uh, install to add any of the packages for any supported version of PHP. Should, they should have versions there up to the most recent, so I know 8.3 is in there. These are the packages we're running. Um, the first three are just your core ones that you've got to have, and you've got to have FPM package if you're going to use fast process management. Curl, Drupal really likes Curl. Drupal definitely likes GD for graphic manipulation. WordPress, on the other hand, uses iMagicK, so I put both of them on there. Um, we install the international and it'd be string stuff because my college includes a school of modern languages. They're doing stuff with all manner of foreign languages with multi-byte characters. Got to have MySQL. We do some LGAP related things for authorization, so I keep the LGAP library handy. Um, Drupal really wants both opcache and APCU to cache stuff and make your Drupal sites run faster. And the others um, are just various things we find very useful. Your mileage may vary. Uh, after you've set all of that up, you may want your default command line to be the newer version. Ubuntu provides a really simple command, update-alternatives, and that will reset the default version to whichever version you want. It's really is just changing the sim links in slash user slash bin, but it, this makes it a little easier and you don't have to worry about messing up permissions or, or anything else. It'll just do it for you. 
All of this, by the way, of course, you have to be running as root. All of these commands. I should have mentioned that earlier. But So now you can configure your PHP FPM. All PHP config is under slash etc slash PHP. And then there's a standard to this. There's a number directory for every version of PHP. So every version has its own configuration. Under that, you're going to find directories for the type of PHP. CLI for command line. Uh, Apache, if you're using the Apache 2 module, and then FPM here for the FPM daemon. Um, there is going to be a php.ini in that directory where you set your primary settings, but then for FPM, you've got to configure pools, and the pri preferred way of doing that is a single file for each pool under pool-d. I provided a config file that shows everything that goes in there, the three lines you're going to look at are user, group, and listen. And user and group are pretty obvious. You're assigning the user account and the group account that this is going, pool is going to run under. Um, listen is the socket. Uh, proxy system uses a socket to talk to the daemon, and every pool has to have a uniquely named socket. So I just put the account name into this template, and that way I know everyone's going to be unique, and I can associate sockets with, you know, accounts with uh, web hosting sites and everything is systematic. You're then going to set up your virtual host. This is pretty straightforward. Um, we do a, a port 80 definition that just redirects to port 443, which is the SSL port. Uh, pretty standard stuff about, you know, opening up what has to be available for Drupal to work right, WordPress. Set up your logs, set up your SSL. The big thing is the file match. So this is how you tell it that you want PHP scripts to run under FPM. You are going to uh, tell it that anything that is a, any file that ends in .php is going to be handled by the proxy. It's a Unix proxy, FCGI, and then this is that socket that you can find in the FPM configuration. Uh, so this has to match exactly. And so where you see again the uppercase ACCT NAME, you're going to replace that with the account name for that particular site. Uh, the rest of this is just uh, other configuration for SSL and this kind of our way of hardening SSL and enabling uh, some other features. Your mileage, again, may vary, but this is you know, the best practices we've come up with. You then have to set up directory permissions to make this you know, reasonably secure. <coughs> so the home directory for each site, you want to make the group of it www-data. And that is so that Apache can get down in there when it's serving non-PHP files. You'll set the permissions, you don't want world to have any permissions, and you want the group to be read and executable. So that blocks everybody out except for the user himself and anybody in the group www gaya And then underneath that, the HTTPS docs is going to be world readable and executable because Apache needs to not only be able to read the files, it wants to enumerate the directories. I found that out the hard way. So you got to open it up like that, but this doesn't hurt anything because the world is blocked up here at the upper level, so the world can't get in there. This is just allowing www-data to get down in there. Um, and then you can make the group and the user, you know, read, write, and execute. We always have a private directory for stashing and scholars and other things that we want to keep there but not be visible to the world. And you want to just lock that one down so only the user can get into it. And the logs and the uh, www, those don't really matter. They're sim links. So this next step is where a lot of people will you know, trip over their feet. They'll set everything up. Everything works beautifully. And then the machine has to be rebooted. And when it comes back up, nothing works. What happened? They forgot to enable the services to come back up when it reboots. Uh, that's not always obvious in Linux that you have to do that, but you do. 
in Ubuntu, it's actually very straightforward. A lot of the stuff is straightforward if you know the command name. But if you don't know the command name, you're like, I don't know where to begin. <laughs> it's system CTL. You give it parameter enable and, a, and the service name, and that will enable the service to restart every time the server's booted up. So you want to enable Apache 2, MySQL, and then PHP, whatever version you're running, dash FPM. So that's basically everything you need to do. You should have a working system. What I did not show there is I've built a script, and uh, that script lets me generate a new site really fast. It just runs through copying the config files, doing the search and replace with you know, regrep type commands, and it saves me a whole bunch of time and, and prevents errors, because if you're manually filling that stuff in, you're bound to plug something in wrong somewhere. So with that script, I can spin up a new site in about 15 seconds. The biggest thing I'm waiting for, really, is just for DNS to refresh when I create the DNS name. <laughs> um, and I love that, because I like being able to get that stuff done and not have to sit around, click, 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 fill in, fill in, fill in. It takes forever. So security. These are a handful of things you might want to look at. A uh, web application firewall, that's going to be monitoring all the traffic that comes in. It's going to look for things that it knows are bad and try to block those requests. Um, that's a good thing to turn on, but you do have to tune it. You have to watch it and you have to see what it's catching and figure out, you know, do you want it catching everything or you want to allow some stuff to go through? Because what, what might look like is bad might actually need to go through to make some, something like, say, CK Editor. CK Editor uses a lot of back and forth Ajax and stuff and might, sometimes a firewall can break that kind of thing. Modivasive is denial of service protection. This is really helpful if you've got a site that's public and someone out there decides they're going to hammer it to death. Um, you can just about use these settings right as I put them without having to tweak anything. And what this is defining is if a single IP address hits a page more than 20 times in one second, it's going to be blocked. If an IP hits any combination of pages within the site, more than 100 times in one second, it will be blocked. And it will be blocked for 10 seconds. Now, that might not sound like a lot, but it's cumulative. So if, if it gets 10 hits there, that's going to be 100 seconds before it will be unlocked. Uh, so if you have a legitimate user who just is going unusually fast, it could happen. Um, all they have to do is just pause for 10 seconds or so, 10, 20 seconds, and they should be unlocked. They're not going to have to to contact you and ask you to unblock their IP. But the bad guy there just using scripts to hit this stuff, this is going to keep them out. Uh, another thing you can enable is within Apache, there's a command called, or a configuration called symlinks if owner match it. Symlinks if owner match. And what that tries to do is if somebody's created a symlink within the site uh, directory, if it does not match the owner, but, um, if, a, if a remote file does not match the owner of the symlink, it won't connect to it. And that prevents people from creating symlinks to things like Etsy password. You know, because that wouldn't match up unless, unless the person creating it was actually a root user. There is a caveat to this. They say that it can be defeated due to race conditions. If you do just the right thing, someone could basically change the assembly right on a fraction of a second between the check and the delivery of the file and you know, point it from something that's acceptable to something that they shouldn't be able to access. But I figure if this blocks 99.9% .9 of the attacks, why not have it on? Just have to be aware it's not perfect. You don't go around telling people it's perfect security when it's not. For your PHP, um, I mentioned before where the PHP INI is. Um, I strongly recommend enabling disable functions and disabling all of these here. Exec, pass through, and system, they're going to be things that call Unix commands or Linux commands. You don't need any 
web-facing script calling regular Unix commands. Um, you shouldn't, at least. Certainly Drupal, WordPress, things like that will never need both that access. And that's a big way that hackers can try to probe the system. If they, if they get in a little bit, and they can push commands through. They could try to use that to get to who knows what on your server. Mm -hmm. Similar with proc open and popen, that lets them look at process tables, and that could reveal sensitive information. Uh, parse INI file would let them load additional INI and possibly change some of these other settings. So block that so they can't change the INI settings once PHP is running. And of course, show source, absolutely. You don't want them to be able to dump the source of the PHP that's currently running. They could learn all kinds of things you don't want them to learn. There's another one. This is of limited security. It's allow URL F open. This used to be really important to set because at one time you had to set that to block people from including a PHP file from a remote source. But they have changed that now with a separate directive called allow URL include. And that's always off by default. This only affects loading a file in, like opening it and reading it in its data. So it's not terribly harmful, but I still turn it off because I see no reason any of our stuff should reach out and grab files off of remote servers. And somebody could come up with a way to do something bad with that, I suspect. So let's just turn it off to begin with. And then the last one, open base directory. This is kind of like the change, change root jail for Unix. You can tell PHP, you can only look at files in these specific directories. You can't look at anything else. And that applies to including files, opening them to read them in for data. It's a, pretty much a full block. Um, but there is, again, some kind of a race condition thing there. I don't remember what the issue is, but they say it's not perfect security, but it's better than not having it on. The trick here is this has to be set per pool. So you have to stick this in the pool INI file, not in the PHP default INI file. And when you're adding config options, there is a little different nomenclature. You would put into the pool config the command or directive php underscore admin underscore value and then in brackets you put the traditional ini directive in this case open base dir and then you just assign it the value you want you're going to assign it to slash home slash whatever the account name is so it can go into anything under the home directory you actually might want to do slash home slash account name slash https and that would lock it further so it couldn't read things in the private directory. I don't know why I didn't think to put that on here earlier, but <laughs> I forgot about that. And then slash temp, because Drupal really wants to look at temp. You can reprogram that in your Drupal settings.ini, but I found it was it's easier to open up temp. I mean, it's not very insecure because temp is already protected pretty well by permissions, it makes it hard for any other user account to see what's going on in there. Um, so that's how I went with it. So that is the presentation. Um, I hope I provided something useful to you, some ideas, or maybe even some concrete ideas on configuration settings you could implement. Um, and I actually have a few minutes left if there's any questions. Yes? PHP editor do you recommend? Um, I actually do my PHP in VI. <laughs> yeah. okay. I'm old fashioned. <laughs> okay. And have you ever considered using something like Bitnami? I just have never gotten into anything beyond VI. Yeah. I've just. Bitnami has a, a system where a package for LAMP, single tier, where you can just click a button and it does all of this heavy lifting for you. Hmm. And you don't have to do any of that. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's not under your total control either. Uh, you know, I've done the heavy lifting; it's a lot of work. But I've done the Bitnami route as well, uh, and it's smooth and it's fast, and you don't have to mess with all that. Setting all that up. And that's at uh, Bitnami.com.
Yes. Is, is your script available anywhere? My script what? Is your script available? Is it on GitHub or anywhere? You, the one you, that... You said you use a, a script to, do, to build your servers with. I haven't put that out there yet. Um, I can look at, see about putting it up there where I have the config files okay. when I get back to work. <laughs> I see it as an example of it all together, what, what you do and stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm not set up a server in a long time, but... Mm -hmm. Have you considered using Debian instead of Ubuntu? I've just stayed with Ubuntu because that's what the rest of my group uses, and I've gotten comfortable with it. Um, the, only, the only upside to Debian, in my opinion, is the stability. Is the what? Stability. Stability. Mm -hmm. And Ubuntu has been pretty stable for us. I haven't yeah. seen too many issues, really. Debian 12 servers are really stable. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the nice thing with you know, going this direction is that most any Linux, you can build this. You yeah. may have to you know, adjust the commands for that specific Linux. Yeah. I mean, you could even go to BSD. I mean, you could build this on a Macintosh or, you know, you something like that. You can substitute like... MariaDB for MySQL as well. Mm -hmm. And you can substitute if you wanted to do, say, Postgres instead of MySQL. Right. You can do that as long as your app works with it. I believe Drupal works with Postgres. And yeah. I use MariaDB or MariaDB. Mm -hmm. Postgres, it just adds a bunch of noise. Sometimes it's kind of Yeah, that's true. Well, I've heard, I've seen things about Postgres is supposed to be like a lot more efficient, or like the bigger databases. But I don't. I haven't looked at fine grain detail data about that. I've just since I started out with MySQL, and we do use Maria in some cases. But Maria and, and MySQL are pretty much similar. right. They're pretty interchangeable. Yeah. Yeah. I, I use an open source control panel, but the configuration is almost exactly uh, what what you're doing there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it just automates a lot of things for me, and I'm familiar with it, so I've been using it for a long time. But as far as uh, LAMP and PHP FDM, it's almost exactly what you're doing, except the sockets are in user land instead of in heads. Yeah, I should say the thing you have to think about, I had to readjust my mind to think about, was what do I need to secure? And I realized with privilege separation, I don't have to secure everything. I just have to secure the PHP scripts. The rest of it doesn't really matter so much because it can't be abused too easily. But one thing I do want to look into one of these days is I don't think it's going to be possible for someone to run a, just a plain old CGI script, and I want to make sure that's fully disabled. Because one place you could run into some hacking if someone figured out how to get in there and drop things in the wrong place. But um, that's the only thing I can think of as far as just regular file access. Apache, if you do each one as its own virtual server and limit its site document area, it should be fairly secure. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you all for thank you. coming and joining me today. Thank you for coming to Drupal Camp Asheville. <laughs>